I think it's better to think of it as a personalist autocracy, uh, heavily focused on the leader and his power, but not uh, in the same way that we saw under, say, Stalin or Hitler or even Mussolini. Brian Taylor, uh, thank you so much for uh, finding the time to to do this. Um, I I really uh, want to hear your opinion on how the Putinist system may have contributed to the decision to go to war. You wrote a book about that. I think you you had some excellent points about how the Russian system works and um, the inner dynamics of the system. Um, and I I think you know in hindsight. The, the war in Ukraine, it, it looks like a mistake. Uh, and I think probably even Vladimir Putin himself by now acknowledges that this was a mistake. But how did it get to there? Um, like, how, how did the system not catch these false assumptions? What, what's your take on that? Yeah. So uh, first, Anders, thanks very much for the invitation. And in terms of Putinism as a system in the war, I guess I would point to a couple of things. So I think of Putinism as a system as having two unequal parts. The first is the formal institutional part, which I refer to as hyper-presidentialism. And the second is the informal and in some ways more important part, which I refer to as a, a combination of clans and networks. Uh, so in terms of the formal part, the hyper-presidentialist part eliminated many of the important, what we would call checks and balances on the presidency and it really concentrated power in the presidency, in the Kremlin administration, and ultimately in Putin himself. And then if we think of the other part, the informal part, I think over time, we saw the various different you know, clans that vie for power and influence becoming increasingly subordinate in some sense to uh, Putin and competing with each other, but ultimately you know, reliant upon his favor and therefore seeking to curry favor with him. So you have... Uh, both parts of the system really funneling a lot of the decision making to the top. And then a lot depends in that situation on the views and mentality of, of the prime decision maker and what information he's getting. And I think if we delve into that, we can see some of the the sources for the, the mistake as, as you talked about it. Yeah, by all means, let's... Um... Let's go into it then. Uh, like, what are some of the, the the drivers for that mistake? Sure. So, I mean, I think we can think of it both in terms of Russian politics and in terms of comparative politics. So, in terms of comparative politics, this is a type of authoritarian system that people would refer to as a personalist autocracy. So, as composed to a single party regime or even a military junta, there tend to be fewer constraints on the leader. And much more depends on that leader. And we know from comparative evidence that these types of systems tend to make more mistakes. They tend to blunder more often into uh, you know, wars that they, they perhaps shouldn't have. So in that sense, there's a broader set of sort of circumstances and cases that we could talk about. But uh, I, I think if we focus in on, on the Russia case, then we have to at some point talk about Putin and his way of seeing the world. And in my view, and this is one of the key arguments of the book that you referred to, it's not just uh, – you know, a single sort of technocratic, pragmatic, rational leader, you know, trying to advance, you know, his power, which is part of what the system is about, about obviously. But I also think it's about a set of ideas, his feelings about Russia's place in the world and that kind of thing. And then I would point to things like uh, you know, his view, vision of Russia as a great power and the need to sort of struggle with the Western system to maintain that status, his feeling about the vulnerability of the system, vulnerability of Russia, his ideas about Ukraine as one nation with Russians and sort of his imperialist vision for Russia, all of those things, uh, you know, feed into his decision making. And in a system without good checks and balances, then 
uh, he sort of was in a position where his subordinates were kind of telling him what he wanted to hear. And you end up with, you know, the FSB allegedly reporting that Russia will be greeted as liberators and they have a lot of people sort of in place who will support Russia once the war starts and all these things that turned out not to be true, but were told to Putin and they were told to Putin because that's what he wanted to hear. His subordinates understood that you tell the boss things that are consistent with his worldview rather than offering disconfirming information. So you get this pattern of, of groupthink and biased information that fed into the decision, I think. So um, how does, like, like you, you say there is a lack of checks and balances, and that's probably true, but still inside the Russian system, there are also some restraints on Putin and things he has to balance, I suppose, between different groups or whatever. Can, can you put some words on how does the Russian system of governance actually work or how, how does the Russian system make decisions? Sure. So I, I think we can set aside for our purposes, the legislative branch and the judicial branch, right? So to the extent that we have conflict that matters, at least for issues of war and peace, it's within the executive branch and also involving these various sort of informal clans and networks. So you might have different interests represented by, you know, the Ministry of Defense, the Federal Security Service, Foreign Intelligence Service, you know, the so-called financial bloc, uh, meaning the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, you know, to a certain extent, the prime minister allied with them might all have their own interests and views on the process. And then you might have, and you do have, you know, various factions vying for influence, trying to advance their interests uh, and competing with other factions. And it, it seems that uh, over time, Putin was listening more and more to, uh, you know, people from the so-called Suloviki with his background, you know, the Ministry of Defense, uh, the FSB, Foreign Intelligence Service, Ruskvardia, the National Guard, all of these agencies Uh, were providing him with information. The, the presidential administration also would be too, but it seems that over time, the intelligence services were the main source of his uh, information about making war and peace types of decisions. Uh, and then it does seem from the reporting that we have available that some of the more hardline factions manage to sort of increase their access to him during the pandemic as compared to maybe other sources of information because because he was more isolated and he was perhaps talking less to some people than he might have in other circumstances. So to take just one example, it seems that over time he became less and less interested in the economic side of decision making, kind of wanted to leave that up to the prime minister and minister of finance and head of the central bank. And we don't really know to what extent they were consulted Uh, if they were really able to provide good information about what they should expect in terms of the economic consequences of the war and that type of thing. We don't have a good handle on, on that, but it does seem that at least certain sections of the government were surprised by the war. And uh, there are rumors that the head of the central bank tried to resign and she was not allowed to resign. So it does seem that Uh, Putin was listening to people with a similar background to him, his closest associates, and maybe not getting a, a broader spread of input like he would have earlier in his presidency, at least on certain issues. So um, is is Russia a totalitarian system? Or, I, I mean, you used the word autocracy, but I, I've, I've seen some people discuss the, the possibility that maybe Russia is turning into a more totalitarian system. W would you say that that's the right characteristic of, of the Russian system? So I personally don't think that's the right way to think of the Russian political system. So I would say that totalitarian systems are, are distinguished by being pretty heavily ideological. And also the totalitarian part of it comes from this idea that they're not just seeking to dominate the political space, but also seeking to heavily dominate the economic space and even the social space. So eliminating you know, all sorts of social and economic uh, institutions that might check 
a, a single party type regime, which Russia is not, right? It's a, it's a personalistic regime. And therefore, um, you know, you kind of eliminate the whole space of society that's in between the state and, and the family and make it all kind of subordinate to the state in this single sort of heavily organized and mobilized pyramid. And although we do see some signs of, you know, attempted social mobilization and things like that during the war. I don't think that's really the trajectory. And I actually don't think Putin is interested in that type of heavily mobilized society. I think throughout his presidency, he's been more interested in demobilizing society, demobilizing voters, making people feel like they don't have any influence in politics, that it's helpless to resist, and, and, and that sort of thing, rather than inspiring them with some vision of the nationality in which everyone must participate and, and that type of thing that we saw, you know, under Stalin or un, under Nazi Germany. So I think it's better to think of it as a personalist autocracy, uh, heavily focused on the leader and his power, but not uh, in the same way that we saw under, say, Stalin or Hitler or even Mussolini. I, I guess I think uh, it's just the elements of it are all not there uh, to think of it that way. Okay. Well, one one thing I'd li also like to hear your opinion about is the question of rationality. Is um, is Putin a rational actor, or can we expect rationality in the way that Russia acts now that they're in this war and things are not really going that well for them? Yeah, um, it's it's a heavily debated question, and I think it depends a bit on which version of rationality we want to talk about. So I think he's clearly capable and does make sort of ends means calculations, right? He's not completely crazy in the sense that he can't put those things together. Uh, but there's a stronger version of the rationality assumption that, you know, posits that that's all he's about, this sort of rational uh, ends means calculation, very much about material factors, very much about power and that kind of thing. And I think to really understand Putin and his decision making, it's not sufficient to just think about him as some kind of pragmatic, you know, technocratic decision maker, uh, because I do think he has strong ideas that motivates the things he tries to do. And I think he has strong feelings about the world and Russia's place in the world and the way Russia should be perceived. And, you know, uh, in that sense, I, I think there are ideas in there about great power statism, anti-Americanism, illiberalism, you know, feelings that Russia was humiliated and not properly respected. And all of those things factor into his decision making. So as long as our definition of rationality includes the ability to make means and calculations about those emotional and ideational factors, then sure, he's rational. But uh, what I worry about is, uh, you know, a too kind of, uh, if I can put it this way, economistic way of thinking about him in, in terms of his decision-making process, when I think it's important to, to think about, you know, what's in his head and what's in his gut because, and what's in his heart. I think all of that is also part of the decision-making process that goes on in any person uh, and in Vladimir Putin as well. So uh, yeah, he's rational in one way of thinking about it, but uh, you know, we shouldn't think of that the way uh, you know, sometimes economists think of sort of human beings as these sort of uh, computers without emotions or ideas or, or feelings.